I appreciate you jumping in and no taking this time today. This is going to be a part of my unscripted series, and we're just going to talk. I've already started recording. <laughs> well, thank you for um, telling me that up front. <laughs> <laughs> I don't let anything slip, you know. <laughs> I think there's a value in the raw just conversation of it sometimes. You know, we get too caught up in scripting things and, and and you know, like reality shows aren't re really reality, but sometimes there's a value in just having an organic conversation. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think that if podcasting was about, you know, reading a script, I don't think anybody would do it. Mm -hmm. And when I am interviewing someone, it's just like a conversation and we're just talking about things, you know, we're getting that information out there, but you know, we're having some laughs and we're joking around and just like you would, if you were having a conversation with someone. Exactly. So I totally agree with what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. So Kat, I would love for you to tell the people who you are, tell the people about your podcast, um, give them a little brief history about who Miss Cat is. Oh, okay. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Cat Corchado. I'm a proud veteran of the U.S. Air Force. I did 20 years, but prior to that, I grew up in the Air Force as a dependent. My dad was already in the Air Force when I was born. He did 22 years. And then I decided to go into the Air Force. Now, keep in mind, I almost went into the Navy because I thought their dress uniforms were amazing. But a recruiter was kind enough to just tell me to stay in my lane. And I did go into the Air Force after all. I'm glad I did stay in my lane, by the way. I didn't mean to do 20 years. It just kind of happened. No one goes in the Air Force saying I'm going to do 20 years but it kind of just happened that way. And I'm so glad that I did actually, that I, I did stay. After I left service was really difficult because my transition wasn't anything like I expected it to be. And so I always like to tell people that when you get out of the military, I felt like I was that first round draft pick, you know, in the, in college ball or basketball, football, you know, everyone's clamoring for your, your name. They want your, they want you on their team. They want to pay you whatever you want. And I walked out those doors list, you know, looking for the banners and the band and the music. And there was nothing there. There was mm -hmm. absolutely nothing there. And I thought, do I have the right day? <laughs> do I have the right time? <laughs> what happened here? And I fell down this, this rabbit hole. Uh, you know, I was kind of floating. I told people I walked out the door and fell off the cliff because no one told me that's what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I finally found my feet on the ground, but not where I thought it was going to land. Back in the day, you did 20 years in the Air Force, you got out and you did exactly the same job, but as a civilian. Mm -hmm. But after 20 years, I put in my resume and someone said, hey, that's great, but you don't have a degree. And I was highly disappointed. And I said, I didn't know what to say to that, but I'd always kept a foot in the fitness field as a, you know, aerobics instructor back in the day, but then as personal training and Pilates, which is what I do today also. And so I found my niche there and then it started, you know, I started getting that itch, you know, I was like, Oh, what else is out there? Mm -hmm. So in 2017, I was invited to a roundtable discussion of women veterans, which is now known as the women veterans network woven. And I started as one of the original peer leaders. There were six and I was one of six. And fast forward to today, I'm one of the national consultants. The other national consultant is Tracy Rosado and she is in San Antonio, Texas. 
And I got this idea to do a podcast. Don't ask me why. I'd never listen to podcasts. My husband does all the time. I didn't. But I thought this would be really cool. So I did all the research. I, I took a, a class. I won't say a class. It was, you know, I paid for it. So it was a class on how to do it. And I launched it. And that's why I just passed my one-year anniversary as a podcaster this year. Hey. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. So there's a lot there to unpack. So I want to go back to, hey, I'm a military brat too. My, Are you? Yeah, my dad did 22 in the Navy. Oh my goodness! I never see. I never knew that about you, Sean. Yeah. You never, you never said anything like that on Clubhouse. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm a Navy brat. I've been everywhere. My dad was a lieutenant commander in the Navy. That, so where was so I'm gonna interview you? I know it's your show, but <laughs> come on, it's a conversation. <laughs> so, what was your favorite place as as a military dependent? What was your favorite place that your dad was stationed? Oh, hands down, I don't even have to think about it. And sadly, it doesn't exist anymore. But Roosevelt Roads, Puerto Rico. Oh my goodness! Yes, I would love to go there. Every uh, hands down. Without a doubt, to the point I'm when my kids get out of school, I'm gonna be in Puerto Rico. I'm gonna buy a property or something. Billy's down there now. I know you're familiar with Billy. Billy's down yeah, there now. Billy's there. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to catch him next year. So. What did you love about it as a child? I don't know. Um, maybe because I was a teenager going through puberty in a tropical island, surrounded by beautiful people. <laughs> And exotic beautiful food. women, come on, beautiful, beautiful girls. Women. I, 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 hey, I've always said the whole time I was there, I never saw an ugly woman. So yes, <laughs> and then the That's fact awesome. that sometimes the alcohol rules are a little bit lax there, especially, and they make I, rum. I bet they are. Hey. I bet they are. <laughs> What's there not to like? <laughs> but for real, they had some of the most welcoming beautiful people there. Um, I've told the story many times where the first weekend we were there, you know, I was I was feeling some kind of way. I was a teenager going through the whole teenage hormone thing. That that by itself was enough. But now you take me from the neighborhood I grew up with in and you uproot me and take me to somewhere I don't know anybody. I don't speak this language. I don't know if I really want to be here. What's a Puerto Rico? You know, and the first weekend we're there, we're on the beach and we meet a family and they just take us in like we're long lost cousins. And the next thing I know, it's a pig in the ground and we're meeting the, the real cousins. And and from then on, it was on. And I, I just love the place. And everybody I went to, it didn't matter that I didn't know how to speak Spanish. And, si and a little known fact, they teach English in their schools. And, you know, you can get by with very basic Spanish and very basic English. And, you know, it's fine. It, it, it's it's an American territory. So English isn't like far fetched. For, right. Yeah. So man. Well, we have a lot in common because my <laughs> husband is Puerto Rican. Oh, really? His family. Yeah. His okay. family. His, his uh, grandfather came to the States. His grandfather was a boxer, actually, okay. when he came to the United States. But I also, as a teenager, my father made me, kicking and screaming, move to Germany at the oh, age of 14. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was not happy. Where is that? Um, no, it's a base. Unfortunately, it's closed now. It's called Bitburg Air Base okay. in Germany. Um, Spangdalem Air Base is still open. But I actually went to high school there, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, and graduated in Germany. So, all right, let me ask you this, too, as a military brat, because this is a great, I mean, I want to have this conversation with somebody. How did you feel? Did now, I know a lot of times when we're going through it, we don't understand the magnitude of being able to just be in a temporarily in a whole nother person's culture and environment. Now, as an adult, how do you think those travels affected you? It affected me greatly, but it affected me in a in a good way. Mm -hmm. My dad would make us, me and my brother at the time, 
would make us go off the base to eat. So if we were in a foreign country, mm -hmm. you know, like say Germany, he would make us go off base and we would eat the food. We would learn how to, you know, deal with the, the foreign money, the currency. And we learned how to speak snippets of <laughs> <laughs> languages, but enough to be able to get around. And so when I look back, it, it was a great blessing because a lot of people would look at us and say, oh my goodness, you had to move all the time, that you poor thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I got to see things mm -hmm. that other kids only get to read about or see on TV. I got to see it in person. So I feel blessed in that way. I think it was it was one of the greatest upbringings ever in that in that format in that frame. Some kids didn't enjoy it, but I loved it. I I loved it, and it wasn't that bad for me too because the first half of my life, my father was stationed on the aircraft carrier, and back in those days, that's back before nine eleven, and they had that strict six months on, six months off. So it was just, that's what it was. I saw him every six months. He was gone for six months. He was back for six months. He was gone for six months, you know. And you just dealt with it. That's it was just, just what normal. it was, right. Yeah, it was normal. You were like, and okay, allowed, dad's going to be gone for six months. You're like, okay. Right. <laughs> and, and that allowed for us to have a um, sort of normal military childhood where we didn't have to move around when we were younger. And that didn't happen to later but we still kept the house the home base and we grew up in a community that um you know i grew up in the hampton rose area world's biggest naval base so it's common to have you know a a friend go away for two years and come back and you know that's no big deal we know how to handle that where is you know in a non-military town that's crazy <laughs> Well, I have a question for you. So this is the downside of being a dependent. Mm -hmm. So my husband, even though I met him when I was in the military, he grew up in a place where even to this day, he can introduce me to a person he went to third grade with. I can't tell you the school I went to or where I was at as a dependent <laughs> when I was in third grade. So how do you feel about that part of it? Do you feel like... Well, so I didn't have that until middle school so i i went through i grew up in a, a neighborhood called camelot wonderful great neighborhood uh, i have an episode if you ever want to learn about my neighborhood i talked to my childhood friend dr john lewis and it describes what it was like to grow up in camelot and it's a neighborhood where to this day i am friends out of maybe the 20 kids in my kindergarten class I'm friends with five or six of them. Like, can pick That's up my amazing. phone and call them right now, friends. And so I grew up in that type of environment. So I didn't have to do a lot of moving, and we didn't have to do a lot of moving. Really, that's the only really major place we went, and we didn't have to go there. But because we went there, you know how it is, they extend this tour if your family comes, you know. So he had to stay there long. No, I think he got promoted. He got promoted and had to stay there a little bit longer. But that's really it. That was the only disturbance. And then I was able to come home and graduate with the same kids that I started out school with. So like I said, I had the best of both worlds. Well, my dad got stationed different places, I, I want to say six or seven times. So we were, even though we stayed at places a minimum of three, a maximum of five years, you know, it, it's hard to remember who you went to school with, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of those bases are no longer, they, they no they longer exist. exist right? right. Yeah. Yeah. And when we also were blessed that when he did get off the ship, the first couple of duty stations were a couple of hours away. So this area of the, of the East Coast is heavily populated with bases. Right. So he went from getting off the aircraft carrier to going to Pax River, Maryland, which is a two hour drive from here. So we used to see him every other weekend. One weekend we'll drive up, one weekend he'll drive down. So that wasn't that bad either. And to us, that was better than six months. We get to see yeah. him next weekend. So, you know. And it's you a just, special yeah. upbringing. I mean, it's, yeah. it's different in the fact that you're on a base and you could leave your kids in the yard, mm -hmm. you know, because you're with other military people mm. you know mom would say oh i'm going over to the you know the commissary or the bx 
and she say, okay, your neighbor, the neighbor's going to watch you, you know, behave, all that other stuff. And you're like, okay, you know, mm. we would just be playing in the yard and we'd play in the yard until she got home. It was a community. So, yeah, yeah it was a community. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I, and okay, so now that you touch, bit, uh, touch on that, I remember the first time as me being an adult out on my own, getting sick and having to go to the doctor and then having to go to the pharmacy. So I'm used to, you know, Navy being on base. Portsmouth Naval Hospital was my second home growing up. I'm used to going to the doctor. He write a piece of paper. You walk down the hall. You hand it through this window. You yeah. have to go sit in this waiting room for about three hours. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Minimum. <laughs> they call your name. You get a little brown bag. You got your medicine and you go home. You go home. Right. Yeah. So I got sick. And I went to the pharmacy, and the guy was like, okay, that'll be like $12. And I was like, $12 for what? <laughs> for what? <laughs> what? Are you trying it's to rob rude, me? What is going on here? It's a awakening. <laughs> it is. You know, even going in the military, you know, they take care of you medical, dental. You get sick, you go <clears> to the hospital. They take care of you. And then I got out of the military, and the first thing I had to do is I had to go to the dentist, and I needed um, a crown. And the doctor said, hey, you know, here's your half, you know. Or no, he says, oh, it's crazy. It's going to be $900. I was like, oh, so my part is four fifty. He goes, no, your part's $900. Right. And I'm like, wait, wait. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. So, yeah, it's, it's a rude awakening when you get out. It, it, that was shocking. And for me, it was, um, excuse me, <clears throat> for me, I had open heart surgery as a child. The military paid for that. Yes. You know. I remember my son got really, really ill. Like he almost he almost died. And we were in Omaha, Nebraska. And one of the things that Omaha has is great schools and even better hospitals because they have teaching hospitals there. And I remember he went to the hospital on base. And, you know, if they can't figure it out, they're like, oh, you got to transport him downtown. Mm -hmm. And so he, he spent a week on base. He spent a week in the hospital. He had five different specialists. They sent him back to the base hospital, and then he came home. And I remember getting the bill, even though I didn't have to pay it. And at this time, keep in mind, this was back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And this was over $35,000 mm -hmm. worth of, of medical that I didn't have to pay. Because if you got referred off base, you know, the, the military ate the bill. But... I just remember thinking, holy crap, because I was a single parent in the Air Force. There's no way I would have been able to pay 35000 in any kind of bill. <laughs> I don't care whether medical or not. So in that way, they really took care of not only you, but your dependents. Mm -hmm. I was, miss that. Yeah, I miss that. Was that. Great. <laughs> People do a lot of complaining, and sometimes I look at the younger generation sideways. I wanted to go in the military. I couldn't because of said heart condition. Mm -hmm. I tried. I wanted to be a Navy pilot. That's what I was going to do, you know, and I could. We tried everything, too, but I couldn't because of that. Right. And I look at the younger generation, and it's 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 sometimes I think it's hard for the civilian life to really understand. And I also agree the military is not for everybody, just like I think college isn't for everybody. Right. But I also think that everybody should try each one of them to know if it's for you. Because if it is, it's a great thing. It's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it's what you make it. Well, I tend to agree with you a little bit because when I speak to younger people, when I say younger people, I'm talking, you know, high school, they're getting ready to graduate. They're not really sure what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Now, some are saying, hey, I'm, I'm graduating, I'm going to college, more power to you. But if you're not sure, you know, the military gives you that time to decide. Like you're getting a paycheck, you know, you're going to work. You have time to say, what do I really want to do? If you want to go to school, you can even go to school in the military. But here's what I, this is what I hear all the time. So I'll be talking to someone and I'll say, well, have you thought about the military? Oh, I can't go in the military. Why? Oh, I don't like people telling me what to do. And I said, okay, do you have a part-time job? Yeah. You have a boss, right? 
Yeah. A boss that tells you what to do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, okay, well, I don't want to wear a uniform. You got a job, right? <laughs> There's a certain <laughs> uniform you have. You can't just walk in in PJs. Mm -hmm. So it, it's how you frame it. You know, you have to be able to say, all right, the military is going to give me this time to be able to decide what I want to do rather than living with your parents for who knows how long, mm -hmm. you know, you can be on your own and be your own person, be responsible for you, get some good skills and then make your decision about what you want to do. And if it comes to that four year mark and you're ready to get out, then get out Bye. Mm -hmm. but you've got something, you've got a trade, you've got something you can rely on and, and pull back if you need to. If anything, you just got out your mama house. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you got out your mama's house. She got to meet a whole bunch of people from all over the world. You had never had a chance to meet. Exactly. And that's just going down to the recruiting office. <laughs> right. Well, I've had people say, well, I don't want to leave my hometown. I'm like, mm -mm. but they complain about it. You see right, people, right. Yeah, oh, my this hometown sucks is the and worst place. And, yeah, 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 yeah. and then I'll say, well, why don't you leave? Oh, I can't leave. My family's here. My, the, this the is way here. this That's town here. is is the way this town is made. I can't leave. Yeah. So I mean that's sad, you know, because even if you come and I've I've interviewed women who came from a small town, went in the military, and came back and realized that now they're bigger than the small town. You know, they've mm -hmm. grown as a person. But what's even more revealing is the fact that there are people that she meets that she went to school with you know, that they're there, their parents were there, their grandparents were there, their great, they all grew up there and stayed there. And she said, I don't understand why they don't want to go, why they don't want to explore. And I don't understand that either. Cause I'm, I just love being able, well, what's over here? Let's do mm -hmm. this. You know, okay, that's not for me, but it was, it was a great experience. <laughs> but I think that's the outlook growing up the type of childhoods we had, you're not afraid. Like I can go, that's why I'm so good at podcasting. You can sit me down in a room with anybody and I can talk to you because when you're in the military, you don't have a choice who is sitting down next to you and you got to be able to perform no matter who or what. But even as a dependent, you remember when maybe not so much you, but I remember my mother would say to me that I could go out, give me 20 minutes, and I'd come back with a friend. You had to know how to make friends. Yeah. Because if you didn't, it was going to be lonely. A yeah, rough time. So I've, I've been talking to people my entire mm -hmm. life in such a way that, hey, I like you, you like me. I mean, you might part ways eventually, but, you know, initially it's, you know, you guys are on the, the, the same platform at that point. And so it's easy for me to talk to people. Now, the only people I can't talk to are the people who don't talk back to me. Mm -hmm. And you know those people, the ones who, how are you doing? Fine. How's your job? Good. <laughs> you know, those one word answers. <laughs> and you're like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> no, I just talk more. I talk more and eventually you'll leave. It's just okay. <laughs> Oh well. <laughs> I can I want I want to talk about your podcast. Tell us all about it please. Sure. So my podcast is called Sisters in Service and I really wanted to have a platform for women veterans to talk about the trials and triumphs in service and out of service. So in service could be good or bad. Out of service, it, especially for me, was not being recognized as a veteran, even to this day, not being recognized as a veteran. And so the last couple of years, especially with the Black, Li Black Lives Matter and all of this, everything that happened. And the one thing I had to look at was how do I present myself to other people? Mm -hmm. So if I walk towards you, what is it you see first? A woman? a black woman, a mother, a sister, a CEO, but never a veteran. Mm -hmm. That's the last, it never enters their mind. So I was in a room in clubhouse and I was introducing myself and I, I told everybody in the room, I said, close your eyes and picture a veteran, any veteran. Could be your parents, a cousin, an uncle, anybody. And I said, now open your eyes and tell me if you 
saw a woman or a man or a woman and 98% of the room pictured a man and not a female. That's why I do my podcast mm -hmm. for that alone, because we need to be seen. And you know, you said that and it made me think, um, I, I grew up in the, I like to tell you, I grew up in the land of unicorns, right? Um, my father being a, a black officer in the Navy, especially in the late seventies, early eighties was unheard of, unheard of. Like you got, you have oh, to yes. see his, his graduating class picture. And I'll let you guess <laughs> who he is. In the <laughs> I <picture>. know. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm used to being the only brother in a room. Right. But all right. So, and this is another time where another way Puerto Rico was magical for me. When we were in Puerto Rico, it was a group of black officers that they used to all hang out together. And at the time, I'm a kid. It doesn't, it's not really hitting with me what's going on, right? right. And uh, my father was an RN. So it was a couple of other um, RNs. And all of these RNs were two incredible women, Miss um, Hattie and Miss uh, Gillespie. And they were lieutenant commanders. And I think one of them, went on to be a captain, right? And I, that, at that time, to say that you know a black woman officer, let alone two. That's huge. Then to come out, do you know who Carl Bashir is? No, but the name sounds familiar. Have you ever seen the movie Men of Service? Men of Honor, Men of Honor. Yes, With yes. The Diver. Yes. One of those ladies was the nurse that was his wife in the movie. Wow. I love it. You know, so I never saw. They've been there, and black women have been there, but it's never oh, the been. Whole, yeah, it's, yes. That's what, I, and I totally agree with that. You know, even when I was in the military, to see not only a female officer, which was woo, mm -hmm. you know, but I, and I can tell you with, for sure, I did not see a black female officer. Did not in mm -hmm. the 20 years that I was in. I did. Now, I'm not saying they didn't exist. But they okay? were That's few and saying. far in between. I'm saying I never got to see one. Right. To see a male black officer was huge. You're like, whoa, you know, and it was nice. You know, like, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to not be recognized as a, as a woman veteran is, is it's hurtful and it's, and it needs to change. And I think the only way it's going to change is because when you watch TV, okay, and let me tell you where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. So the last, uh, let's see the last, um, veterans day. Okay. You are watching TV and you know, they're all the news casts are, you know, about veterans, et cetera. And every lot now, maybe I'm wrong. Okay. And I'm talking from North Carolina. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're from Texas, I know they love y'all. <laughs> veterans. Texas love their veterans, but I'm in North Carolina and they went to the usual, you know, the Vietnam veteran, the male, mm -hmm. and I love my, my, my male veterans, but where was the female mm -hmm. veterans? Where were they? Yeah. And so I'm, I'm putting a challenge out there for anyone who's listening that the, We've got, you know, Veterans Day coming up and I want I want to see some footage of women veterans. I want to see it. Yeah. It is Veterans Day, right? November eleventh. Yeah. I I have kids and so I don't <laughs> know like, what day oh, it is. I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I think this is a Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> That's as far as it goes. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's and I have friends in Texas like, oh, we're doing this. We got this parade and we're, we're going here and we're celebrating. And I looked up in North Carolina and we might get a parade, maybe kind of, sort of, mm. but that's it. And that really angers me. It makes me, it makes me crazy because North Carolina supposedly really likes veterans. Mm -hmm. we're, oh, I'm sorry, they're veteran friendly, which if anyone's listening to this, I've been in North Carolina for 12 years. If you could tell me what veteran friendly means, 
please contact me because I'm I'm trying to figure out what that means. They allow us to live here. They take our money. <laughs> they're tax. What? <laughs> I'm just trying to figure it out. <laughs> just saying. Yeah, I understand. I understand. But it's a great thing, and I I say it often and. I want to thank you for your service uh, because oh, thank you. it's a great thing and it's an honor to be able to share the stage with you. Well, it's been, you know, so fun to, to get a little bit, to know a little bit more about you, Sean. We have so much in common and I didn't even know until we did this today. Who yeah. knew? Because yeah. for anyone listening, I met Sean on Clubhouse. So, you know, we don't really get a chance to talk about this type of stuff because to be honest when I'm in clubhouse and I've been in other rooms where I'll come up on stage and I'll say oh you know I'm this I'm gonna I'm a veteran I'm sister service podcast and all I here's what I get thank you for your service <laughs> I'm like wow that's that's it okay thank you <laughs> <laughs> but you know you get used to that so that's what I'm talking about. And not all the time. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, they'll back channel me. Thank you so much for serving. You know, and that's wonderful. I love that. But when you get crickets, you know, when no one, you know, no one, you know, says, oh, I have someone I, I think, you know, would be great for your podcast. That just tells me that they don't know any veterans, mm -hmm. not women. Mm -hmm. They might know a lot of male veterans, but they don't know any women veterans. And that bothers me a lot, a lot. Just yeah. saying. And it's, it's, and there's so many there. And there's so many that are in the military now that's going to come out. Um, yes. I was lucky enough um, to address a room full of um, doctors for the, for the Navy a few weeks ago. For, um, you know, I represent the LVAD community and they um, they wanted to be able to train, but nobody knew anybody with LVAD. <laughs> so they found me and I got to address a group of doctors and maybe a third of that room were women. So they're it's there, but they're just not acknowledged. And I totally agree with you. And here's my other pet peeve. So I'm on LinkedIn all the time. You know, I always see people who are going on these boards, you know, to talk about veterans. So they're in, you know, veteran, they're VSOs, veteran service organizations. Wonderful. But what I find is that a lot of these VSOs have people who are going onto these panels to talk about veterans veteran issues how were women veterans being i know treated or you know but they're not veterans that are speaking why can't they find women veterans to be on these panels mm -hmm. i'm sure if they put out an all call we need women veterans nationwide to do this you, they would be inundated with emails mm -hmm. but no one does that and that's one of my other pet peeves i'm just putting it out there <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, who better to talk about veteran issues than veterans? Right, exactly. You know, I can't talk about being in Puerto Rico because I've never been. I want to go, by the way. <laughs> but I can't talk about things that I've, I don't have no experience with. And guesstimating isn't going to cut it. Right. But that, that is all. <laughs> And I'm going to ask you a question before we wrap it up. Okay. If you could change one thing for women veterans as a whole, what would you change? I would change the way non-veterans, also known as civilians, see women as, as veterans. I would change that. I would change it to where everybody would see not only male veterans, but female veterans also. And you wouldn't have to ask. You would just say, they must be a veteran that they would know automatically. That's what I would change is to be recognized as a female veteran. Awesome. All right. So now you get to answer my question. I ask everybody. Uh Oh, if a young cat came to you 
and ask you for life advice, what would you tell her? Male, female, or doesn't matter? A young cat. So it would be a young you. A young cat. Yes. I would tell her to not be afraid and to just move forward. As a young person, I was scared of my own shadow. I was a people pleaser. Don't people please. Please cat. And don't be afraid, but move forward in your fear. Hold That's on. it. Hold on. Can, how can everybody get in touch with you? How can they reach you? How can they get to your podcast? Oh, my podcast is on all the <clears throat> platforms, but it's called Sisters in Service. But you want to put dashes, so sister da sisters dash in dash service, um, or you can just type in Cat Corchado, and I'll pull be pulled up. Whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Instagram, um, I hope that you will take a listen even if you're not a veteran, but especially if you are a female veteran, you know, just take a listen. I have all kinds of guests on there from, you know, authors, because I like to celebrate women veterans who are out there like, that I like to say are doing the damn thing. They're mm -hmm. doing it. And so if they have their own business, so they have a 501c3, they're just out there giving back. So that's what I found, find about veterans is that they want to give back. So sisters in service, not only in service, but out of service. So I hope you guys will take a listen, follow me. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Um, we're wrapping this up. The final days of the C4 challenge from the content creators of color. It's been an incredible ride. Um, I hope you guys learned something. I know I've learned something. Um, check us out on Instagram at creators underscore of color. Un oh, I'm sorry. Creators underscore of underscore color. Um, you can search for us anywhere you get your favorite podcast. And don't forget, you can check me out at 757renaissanceman.com. Cat. I really appreciate this. This is this conversation has been a long time coming. You know that, right? I do. Yeah. <laughs> and we made it happen. It happened on the fly, you know, and you just do it. And it's done. See, now it's done. Now it's done. So I hope <laughs> that this is not the last time. I hope so, too. I hope we, we get to collaborate on some stuff and we get to work together on some things because I think it would be totally interesting you know, to, to do something together. So thank you so much, Sean. It's been a pleasure. It's been all mine. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to a special edition of the 757 Renaissance Man podcast. I'm Sean. That's Kat. And we're out. Peace. Bye.